For Cindy Stultz, it all started with an emergency. When my daughter um, first had a health crisis and ended up in the ICU, um, you know, the hospital staff actually, um, after it looked like it was something very serious and it, she might be there for some time, they told us about the CaringBridge site and um, said it was a way to communicate with people so we wouldn't have to be on the phone all the time. And the blog format website helps people connect with each other during illnesses and for Parisa, who would end up with brain cancer, the new media tool was perfect. This would be a great tool because already, you know, we were, we were spending a lot of time doing that. And um, we knew there were so many people that cared about Parisa um, that it would be um, just a very easy way to let people know what was going on. Updates on Parisa's condition, instructions for visiting the hospital, and even pictures all went on to the site. It wasn't long before things caught on. It would be like a check my email, check CaringBridge, check Facebook. Like it was in front of my list. Uh, I checked it like every 10 minutes. Um, like every time I was at a computer, I'd refresh the screen because I needed to see if there was any updates. Country borders didn't stop the IP address. Um, my husband being from Iran, of course, most of his relatives are in Iran. So, um, you know, they were always checking that caring bridge. It really helps, like, especially p like her family that's in Iran, it's really helpful because they wouldn't be able to know anything if it wasn't for, like, websites and caring bridge and Facebook and stuff. And it wasn't even Cindy running the website. I called my sister and had her actually be the author and, um, you know, um, take care of the whole site. That way it was even, um, you know, it was even easier for me because all I had to do was make one phone call, tell my sister the update, what was going on, um, and she would just put it right in for us. But it wasn't always easy to make the call. I guess the biggest challenge was giving accurate information but not... Um, remaining positive about, hey, we can beat this, you know, and also being careful about how we expressed information because, you know, Parisa would eventually be reading the entries. Um, and we didn't want to, uh, you know, if you can't deny an illness, but we didn't want her to get a negative impression that she's not going to make it or something. Or receive the news. It's really weird, especially knowing that she, was, she wasn't awake and she couldn't talk and she had no idea what was going on around her and that I couldn't just like talk to her. Um, somebody was talking for her pretty much on the website. It was just, it was unreal. You know, every time I'd read them, I would call my parents immediately crying and be like, I want to come home, I need to be home. And like many cases of brain cancer, this story didn't have a happy ending. I found out the morning she died, well, I woke up at like noon and I had like 20 missed calls. Parisa's battle ended on October 28th, but the website wasn't done. I would say the Caring Bridge reached more people as far as, um, you know, the services for Parisa and the calling hours, probably more than the newspaper, I'm guessing. More than 700 people showed up to say goodbye. And for friends, they were just glad to have been kept in the know. I don't know what I would have done. It, it would have been even harder. It was hard reading them when they were bad, but it would have been harder if I didn't know what was going on. And for a family, the realization that it was more than just a blog. Oh, just, I, I can't. It's so, so grateful. <laughs> you know, I mean, not only was it a tool for communication, but um, as I read entries, I realized that it was also a way for people who signed the guest book. It was kind of a journal for them to, it was kind of a, you know, a way for them to express their feelings of concern. And it was really therapeutic for a lot of people.